Welcome everybody to our group uh, quantum information group talk. Today we have opportunity to invite Dr. Chiru Mukhopadhyay as a speaker who is currently pursuing his postdoc at UESTC Chengdu, China. He is currently working on uh, many body quantum sensors. Uh, he will be talking about one of his current works on uh, modular many body quantum sensors. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. Let's hear about uh, the, the, the topic. Uh, floor is yours too. Thank you, Sajibda. <laughs> Very kind introduction. Okay, so uh, to, good afternoon good evening i don't know it's afternoon in poland right so good afternoon everybody let's start so today i'm not going to be talking about something that's super technical it's more of an ideas thing that uh, i'm i mean we are proposing essentially one new not exactly new but kind of the modification of the way of building many body quantum sensors so there can be like lots of uh, works that build upon it uh, by no means this is very exhaustive so uh, let's begin now so, I mean, before we start with that topic proper, let's talk about something about our group. So it's basically in Chengdu, UESTC. So China set up these universities dedicated. So, for example, the universities that one has in Europe, those universities are like medieval universities and all of them were set up to do everything, essentially. China got their independence uh, like relatively late. And then they, they decided to set up universities which are specifically geared towards one particular thing. Like there are, I mean, the big university, everybody knows it's a FA, right? University of Science and Technology. So it was like set up to be a science and technology hub. So UESTC was set up in like 1950s to become like a more of an electronic science hub. I mean, radar was the hot thing back then. I mean, not quantum, classical radar. And they wanted to study properties of radar and electronic properties and these things. And that's how the university started. It's a big university now these days. And uh, well... You can see Chengdu, it's the less boring part of life, not the university, it's basically the nightlife right next to the city uh, river. Okay, so now our group. So you might know Shovik. So this is this this guy who's like in, appears in the bottom right picture. So Shovik was in IFAN for a couple of years until 2021, if I'm not mistaken, in Thomas Tovinsky's group. Uh, and other two, I mean, Shovik has like, I mean, is that stuff that I'm going to be talking about, Shovik is not a direct collaborator, but uh, he was a collaborator on some of the stuff that uh, we'll discuss like on the lead up to the main thing. And then we two are basically the main culprits who did this work, Abul Hosel Bayot. So he's the group leader in our group in UESTC and then me. And these are our rest of the group members. So from left to right, you can see it. So this guy is from Chile, Victor Montenegro. This guy is from China slash UK. She's our secretary from left to right. This guy is a PhD student. And then you have, uh, this guy is another PhD student seated, seated right next to me. And then you have uh, two master's students. And then you have a postdoc from Pakistan. Then you have uh, the beautiful lady in front. So she is a postdoc from Iran. And then right in front, I mean, he, she is a PhD student from China. So, I mean, our group is a pretty diverse international kind of group. <laughs> and you can see the formulas like right, written on the stairs. Okay, so let's talk about subject proper. So the idea is to first talk about quantum sensing, like in the abstract. Uh, not to talk about some specific protocol, but to talk about what quantum sensing does, like to have a brief introduction. I'm sure that most of you already know a lot of about quantum sensing, but still, I mean, just a brief introduction to set the notations and stuff. And then I will talk about many body quantum sensing, which is uh, that uh, the broad topic of this uh, seminar. And then I will talk about some theory parts related to many body quantum sensing. And then finally, I will talk about the modular design that uh, basically is our work. Okay. So let's go forwards. So whenever we talk about a sensor, I mean, it can be quantum, it can be classical, anything. The idea, I mean, the, the, the diagram that you see on the screen, the, the basic idea stays a constant. I mean, no matter whether this is quantum or classical. 
So you first take a probe. So suppose that you want to measure the temperature of a room. How do you do it? You get a thermometer. You insert the thermometer in the room. You allow it to thermalize either completely or partially. So there is some interaction with the parameter of interest, which is temperature in our case. And then you get the thermometer out. Then you read off the measurement from the thermometer. Right. I mean, that's how every sensing protocol proceeds. So in the quantum case, so instead of a thermometer, classical thermometer, you input a sensor probe state, which is initialized in some state. And then the, the probe interacts with the parameter. Interacts is the, within quotes because the interaction is, I mean, for example, with the temperature T, you can look at it as a physical interaction between baths. With other parameters, it can be that it introduces some extra parameter in the Hamiltonian of the evolution itself. And then once it is done interacting with the parameter, with the environment which holds the parameter, then you get the probe state back. And then you perform some measurements on it. And then once you have the measurements, then you have the classical measurement results. And then you process these measurement results to construct an estimator. This estimator will allow you to estimate the value of the parameter that you have just experienced. So in this whole procedure, there are these uh, six different steps. So the first step is what probe to choose. For example, in the, I mean, these are all common to classical sensors as well. So there's nothing very quantum about it. So the first one is what kind of probe that you are choosing. The second one is once you have fixed the probe system, then what initial state that you are initializing it. The third is how do you decide to interact with the environmental parameters? Then you decide how long you want to interact with the environment, whether you are taking it out early or whether you are allowing it to interact fully and these things. The next thing, which is quantum, is that you now have a choice. In classical sensing terminology, you do not have a choice. I mean, there is no incompatible basis. So basically, every basis is equivalent. But in quantum mechanics, you have a specific choice of basis. Okay. And then you get probabilities. And here, in a sense, uh, quantum sensing is less troublesome than classical sensing. If you want to do something uh, classical sensing, then you have to set up the probability model yourself. Like, how do you get the underlying probabilities? But in quantum mechanics, you know the bound rule. So that is the, the rule that gives you probabilities. So then one, by the bound rule, you get the uh, measurement statistics as outcomes. And these you can write down in a piece of paper. And this is classical, entirely classical, the measurement outcome results. Once you have fixed the measurement basis. And then you can take this classical data and you decide what to do with it, essentially. So how do you construct estimators? How do you find out the estimate? I mean, these are all the uh, classical statistical problems. There is no, nothing very quantum about it. Uh, for example, if you want to construct maximum likelihood estimators, you can. If you want to construct like more efficient estimators, like this Rao Blackwell kind of estimators, you can. So that part is not very quantum. -y. Okay. So uh, am I clear until now? Hello? Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, perfect. So now once we have constructed the estimator, now what we want to do? Basically the estimator, I mean, for maximum likelihood estimator, I would take an example the maximal likelihood to where the estimator is. So suppose that your temperature is, I mean, it can be anything between like zero to 100. So your estimator that you have constructed from the experimental data shows that the maximal likelihood, the maximum probability of that estimator is around T equal to say 50, okay. So then you, as a first estimate, you, you estimate the parameter to be 50, okay. Now you build up more statistics as you get more and more data, and you finally fine tune the estimator so that it finally is uh, centered around, I mean, hopefully, the actual value of the parameter. Okay. So now, asymptotically, if you have n rounds, then the variance, I mean, because the data, I mean, is getting more and more refined, that uh, variance would go down as one, 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 one over n if this is IID. And the measurement results outcome the statistics and then one over n times this n is the number of rounds that you have constructed the measurement out of and times some quantity which we call the fission information so this is a lower bound which is also known as a Kramer row bound so for variance there is a lower bound to variance variance of the estimator okay the width of the estimator you can call it 
So if this width is uh, zero, then essentially it means that you are measuring with infinite precision. If the width is uh, finite, you are measuring with some finite precision. So but normally we do not talk about the number of rounds because every round it's identical. You are setting in the same bunch of uh, particles every time. It is interacting in exactly the same way. So you get statistics, which is basically randomized. So the quantity of interest in our case would be the precision, which is just the Fisher information. But now this Fisher information, so you can look at the expression, it depends on the probabilities and how the probabilities change by changing the parameter value. Okay. Now these probabilities themselves, they are dependent on what basis you choose to measure in. Okay. You can take a basis in which, I mean, the probabilities do not change at all. So in that case, you can get, I mean, you do not get much information from the system. So there is always a, uh, like an optimization involved that you want to get the best possible measurement basis, best possible in the sense that this sufficient information, this is optimized, this is maximized. So that the fission information is maximized, this is denominated down below. So therefore the variance should be as less as possible. So as, or the sensor is as precise as possible. So this is the core idea that when we talk about sensing precision, at least in the context that I'll be talking about in this uh, seminar, uh, the fission information you can take as a proxy of uh, the sensing precision. So, but I want to like uh, to reiterate, this is one way of uh, de defining it. So there are uh, assumptions involved in it. One is that this only works in the asymptotic limit, that this bound is there. If, if you have finite set of statistics, then this bound may not be a tight bound. You can get something better, or you can get a Bayesian kind of estimation where you do not have this point estimation uh, paradigm altogether. Okay, but what we will be talking about, we will be talking about some kind of frequentist picture where the parameter is really assumed to have a critical value, and then we have construct the point estimators. Okay, so let's go forward. So now comes the quantum sensing part. So how do we go about quantum sensing? I mean, let's talk about something which is like a very canonical example. Everybody knows, but let's again say it. So uh, the example was uh, McCone Lloyd and Giovannetti's paper, uh, Ramsey interferometry kind of experiment. So the idea is that you start off with a bunch of qubits, which uh, you start off with some in uh, initialization zero, and then you pass it through a phase gate, where this zero qubit would gain a phase, like say theta, and then it will become zero plus e power i theta times one, right? So if you set, uh, send them individually, like one by one, with not entangled, then finally what you will end up with, you, you start off with like uh, n copies of zero, you end up with n copies of like theta rotated states of zero, okay? And now if you calculate the Fisher information, if you want to measure the uh, parameter theta, then uh, the rotation, if you want to calculate the Fisher information, you will get that this is proportional to n on these product states. However, if you initially prepare the state, instead of sending it all of them as like a zero tensor product 10, like in a product kind of structure individually one by one, if you, if you have all these states initialized to zero, and then you construct a GHG state out of it by like providing like a, a C naught gets between them and finally getting this big GHG state, zero, 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 zero plus one, 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 then on this collective state, the, the rotation angle is n theta. And then once you calculate this the Fisher information of 0, 0, 0, 0 plus e power i n theta 1, 1, 1, 1, then you will see that the Fisher information just cancels n squared. Okay, so what has happened? So this measurement is in computational basis, uh, and there is a like a mathematical result that says that once you have the state preparation state level, I mean, once you have the entanglement in there, the measurements need not be entangled at all. So, I mean, just an equivalence result. So, but here what happened is that you in, entangle these states, and then finally the Fisher information precision, if you have N, the precision scales as N squared instead of N, okay. So that means that if if you say that you want a precision of 100, I mean, very loosely, you want a precision of 100, then previously you had to send in 100 qubits. Now you can do the same thing with essentially 10 qubits. So this is the core kind of appeal behind quantum sensing, that you can 
I mean, uh, you can look at it two ways. One is that you can get more precision out of the same number of um, uh, sensing probes, same size of sensing probes. Or you can uh, use like far smaller sensing probes to get the same precision. So the, on theory, on paper, this is the basic idea, I mean, appeal behind quantum sensing. But now a difficulty comes in that when you actually want to implement this thing in a lab, I mean, ZHG is a very, very fragile state. So I wrote down the state as 0000, 000 plus 1111, which is fantastic. But now imagine that one of these wires go dead. I mean, it can happen. I mean, one of the particles you can lose. So the rest of it, the rest of it are not even entangled. And then even if one wire is cut off or there is noise in the system, I mean, the, uh, the fissure information gets down from n squared to n very, very quickly. So it's very, very fragile. I mean, it's very easy to understand theoretically on a piece of paper. But when you want, want to actually do it in a lab, uh, suppose that you want to create a, like a 20 qubit JG state, it's damn difficult to do. Okay. So, but then, I mean, phase estimation algorithms have, uh, I mean, not algorithms, phase estimation kind of uh, sensing protocols. I mean, they have also grown. I mean, this is not like a huge part of my talk, but uh, uh, I mean, uh, this problem that I said about GHG states, I mean, it's not something that you cannot recover, but I'm just using this as an example to say that, okay, we need to do something more robust. Okay. So what kind of physical systems can we use where losing one or two particles do not matter much? Okay. So when we talk about losing one or two particles do not matter much, I mean, the obvious example to turn to is thermodynamics, right? So what happens uh, in the macroscopic limit, which you can see like some kind of phenomenon in the macroscopic limit, which seems good for quantum sense, which seems good for sensing in general, forget about quantum sensing. So but like, let's, let's ask a question. When you have a thermometer, so you see that the thermometers are calibrated at like boiling point of water and freezing point of water or boiling point of some substance and freezing point of some substance. Why is it? I mean, I could have chosen to calibrate it at what, 70 degrees, uh, 45 degrees, something like that, right? So uh, it turns out that there is a very simple reason that at that temperature, phase transitions occur. So phase transitions mean that you give the system a very, very small signal and the signal gets essentially amplified. You can give like two signals which are almost identical and they will have like drastically different results. Like, I mean, for example, for you know, this first order phase transitions, you supply heat, I mean, the, the, it doesn't uh, run from uh, solids to liquids, but then if you supply a small amount of heat, then it turns from solid to liquid very, very fast. So at that point, the system is extremely respons responsive to whatever parameters that you are exposing the system to. Okay, so th this is uh, like a, a recurring theme in this uh, many body sensing schemes. So uh, for example, I mean, if you have uh, the, uh, if you're looking at the diagram on the left, so this is like this uh, very, very well-known example of, of uh, uh, paramagnetic ferromagnetic transitions so if you this is all classical this is got nothing to do with quantum mechanics i mean the spins are like classical in that sense so now you decrease the temperature you start off i mean at very high temperature limit so there basically the spins are randomly aligned so the average magnetization is zero and then once you hit a certain critical temperature this is the Curie temperature then this in the magnetization that is already there in the system, it amplifies like, and then it goes to like two of these, I mean, the symmetry essentially between up and down is broken. And then you can either end up at the fully up magnetized state uh, or the fully down magnetized state. I mean, both of them are equivalent in, in terms of magnetization. It can be up magnetized up or it can be magnetized down. The point is that all of them align along the same direction. Okay, so why up and down only two directions? Because this is classical, classical spins. I mean, they can only point up or point down. Okay, so if if you want to like be be a more creative or mathematical, you can write down the uh, the free energy of the system, which is quartic, and then you see that this quartic like x square plus x four, this kind of potential. So this potential can I mean depending upon the parameter the coefficients, I mean they can have one well or they can have two wells. So for example, so you, you look at the topmost one. So this looks like a single well, say a single stable point. 
So this occurs when, I mean, this M4 term is, this beta term is very small. So essentially it looks like a parabola. So with only one stable fixed point. And then as you go on increasing the beta with respect to alpha, at a critical value, so this stable fixed point suddenly turns into an unstable fixed point. Now, depending upon whichever direction you give the push to, it will push towards that particular new fixed point, okay? So in the sense, I mean, this direction of push, so if, if you can, I mean, if I say that this sensing is basically this direction of push, I mean, if it's very, very small, even if it's a very small signal, it will ultimately determine why, where I end up next. Okay, so the system is extremely sensitive at the critical point. So, I mean, that's the rough idea why we want to use this as a quantum sensor. As a sensor in general, but let's talk about quantum phase transitions now. Okay, so uh, when we, you look at many body sensing like uh, literature, so there are broadly two approaches. One approach is that, okay, we will borrow the phase estimation algorithm kind of stuff, and then you will feed this and then instead of estimating the collective phase, we are going to estimate some kind of phase shift that happens due to the collective spin of the system. I mean, if it's a many body spin system, fermionic system. Okay, so that's one uh, approach of doing things. So here the idea is that, uh, you know, I mean, no matter whether this is quantum or classical, critical points are associated with long range correlations, right? So even if the system is short range correlated uh, away from the critical points, uh, the correlation length kind of go off as exponential minus of the length at the critical point these are scale invariant so you have pretty long range order long range correlations so now at the quantum critical point so the for the thermal phase transitions i mean for example uh, the uh, fermionic the ferromagnetic paramagnetic example that i gave the curie temperature one this was uh, driven by uh, thermal fluctuations so now we if we talk about phase transitions which are driven by quantum fluctuations so uh, say that you have something at temperature t equal to zero where there is no thermal fluctuation at all then for these systems at critical points uh quantum fluctuations become large okay uh, roughly now then i mean we know the uncertainty principle relation right that if one bunch of fluctuations are super large then we can probably find another bunch of fluctuations which are super small okay now the core idea is to use that phenomenon to feed these systems at their critical ground states as feeder into the interferometer system okay and then your goal is to estimate this phase psi uh, where s total is the total spin operator of the ising chain of the heisenberg chain whatever chain and then you want to calculate the quantum fission information of this setup of psi the fission information with respect to psi. Okay, so this is one approach that's uh, popular and that uh, Shilda showed like uh, four or five years back that uh, yes, this approach indeed gives you uh, beyond classical kind of n-square scaling. Uh, I mean, no matter where, whether you are doing it with 1D ising, 2D ising, 3D ising, whatever. Uh, but this approach is something that we, we will not take we will talk about Hamiltonian parameter estimation. So the difference between these approaches is that in the approach that we are going to be take, taking, the right one, we are not feeding, I mean, the ground states are not fed into an interferometer to calculate the phase shift. We are directly measuring on the system itself. Okay. So in this case, again, we, if we have the order parameter, I mean, let's look at, I mean, like a simple example, like a transverse sizing. So we know that the, for this system, if you add uh, an external magnetic field to the system to an ising model, a transverse magnetic field, then if the magnetic field direction is, if the magnetic field strength is super large, then everything aligns along the external magnetic field. Okay. So the internal uh, couplings, I mean, they do not even matter. So it's like a uh, paramagnetic kind of phase, but then, at the other extreme that if the, the environment the, if the magnetic field is super weak then basically the entire physics is dominated by uh, the the internal couplings so if the internal coupling is ferromagnetic everything aligns along that direction and you see i mean those directions are transverse so one is along x one is along z so we will see things aligning on different directions and now 
if you want to calculate the fission information with respect to the external magnetic field, I mean, if you want to measure the temperature, if you measure the magnetic field, for example, then uh, the parameter of interest is quantum fission information with respect to the external magnetic field in the Ising model H, right? So now, previously what I told was that fission information, uh, classical fission information. So if you optimize over all bases, if FPI, so these PIs come from the measurement basis pi, if you optimize over all possible measurement basis, you will get the quantum fission information, which is the best you can do. Because this bound, at least for one very one observable, in principle, this is tight. Okay. But in practice, to actually calculate it this way, that we are going to be calculating uh, classical fission information with respect to all bases, and then you are going to be optimizing over the basis. In practice, this is enormously hard to do uh, for many body systems in particular, and nobody does it. Uh, so, but uh, there was a paper in 1990s by Brownstein and Caves where they showed that quantum fission information, you have a geometrical interpretation. You can look at it as basically the difference between, I mean, the susceptibility of the fidelity between the state, the probe state we are looking at. Okay. So the fidelity is basically the inner product, at least for uh, pure states, inner product between a state which is at parameter lambda, which is uh, in the Ising case, which is just the magnetic field and the ground state at which is lambda plus d lambda which is if you change the magnetic field by a very small amount okay so now look at what we expect if you are deep within one phase suppose that we are like uh, the magnetic field is like 10 times the uh, internal couplings so then the external magnetic field dominates so everything is aligned along the external magnetic field so if the magnetic field if, uh, value you change by a little bit, the orientations do not change at all. Okay, I mean, it, it changes by a very small amount, like one atom in like 500 flips or something like that. So therefore, the, uh, I mean, this inner product is pretty much close to one. Okay. Uh, but if you are near the critical point, so then you see, I mean, you are approaching the critical points from towards the left or towards the right. So if you are approaching the critical points from the left, then adding a extra small delta H to the system may uh, like may kick it out of the edge towards the uh, towards the paramagnetic regime. So a small change in the parameter value may turn out to have some drastic impact in the state in the ground state of the state. Okay. So this is the thing that we are going to be using. And then Brownstein and Caves found that this fidelity, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so Brownstein and Caves found out that this fidelity, uh, I mean, the susceptibility of this fidelity with respect to the extra, with respect to the order parameter, I mean, this essentially is identical to the QFI modulo some multiplicity factor. Okay, so any questions until now? I think you can continue. No, please feel free to stop me whenever you like. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, I've not talked about uh, critical quantum metrology. Now, I mean, this is exactly what I was talking about, that you have competition. So, I mean, this is the crucial difference between this and phase estimation. In phase estimation, the Hamiltonian is e power i theta t. So there is no internal Hamiltonian of the system to speak about. I mean, obviously you can write out a dagger a, but uh, the Hamiltonian that it evolves by is essentially the uh, Hamiltonian of the um, unitary evolution here. So he, in many body sensors, so you have two uh, competing effects. One effect is due to the system, uh, probe's internal coupling. And the another effect is due to the external parameter that the probe is exposed to. Okay, so now uh, depending upon which one dominates, the system is in one phase or another, but then at the phase boundaries, that's where the interesting fun thing happens. So that's when at the phase boundaries, so the, the susceptibility of the system, the fidelity susceptibility, the, uh, I mean, the order parameter susceptibility in terms of second order equation, the phase transitions, I mean, these are all super large. So therefore at the critical point, at the phase transition point, you can use this as a quantum sensor. Okay, and then you want to, if you want to actually calculate the quantum fission informations, so you can see, so right like uh, deep within each of these phases, the QFI scales as the system size n, which we call the standard quantum limit, which is basically the classical limit. Uh, 
and then at the critical point it scales as i mean it's basically the scaling law depends on the facts on the critical exponents but uh, by and large it scales as n square i mean it's a fair thing to say okay so now so th this we talked about second order phase transitions so here so, I mean, sorry, uh, hello uh, i'm rafa uh, hi can i interrupt hello. you for a second yeah sure because i think it's a important point here to stress because somehow when you say that here also you have Heisenberg or non Heisenberg, it's it may be a bit surprising. Why? Why so? Because the framework is different. I mean, the the standard Heisenberg and non Heisenberg is in in this phase estimation scheme you described before, mm -hmm. where we say that we send some probe through a dynamical process where where we have some parameter encoded in this dynamical process. Yes, here you. You look at how the ground state changes under the Hamiltonian changes or of your system, yes. and and somehow if you have nonlinear interactions, I mean it can yeah. be arbitrary. The scaling yes. can yes. be arbitrary. Yeah, and and uh, and if one wants to to somehow uh, understand it better, I think mm -hmm. it's essential to to talk about this time required for for actually relaxing to this state. Yes, ex you are, exactly. You are, you are, you are, I'm, I'm not sure whether you are going to talk about it, but I think it's it's a crucial thing to be able to somehow coherently compare these two approaches that you have to admit here that, okay, the parameter changes, but maybe I have to wait very long until my system relaxes to the ground state and I can be happy that I have high sensitivity. Because... For example, if your example with water <laughs> freezing, yes. In fact, I think it's not a very good example in the sense that you would probably not use water to measure temperature around freezing point, because if you want to measure like whether it's plus 0.1 or minus 0.1, you would need to yes, wait very long point. until it melts yeah. and until it freezes, okay? Because yeah, it takes yeah. a lot of energy to to yeah, be transferred yeah. to to yeah. go through this transition so so in here there is also for for me it's always this suspicion that okay it looks fancy nice but if i want to use it i would have to wait extremely long and my parameter would need mm -hmm. to be very stable on very long yeah. times yes. to really use this method so so i i i yeah. I, I would like you somehow to comment maybe on this as well no i i, I fully agree i fully agree with that sentiment so uh, basically to what i mean the, the, there is this prx paper i mean i don't know whether you were the, one of the authors of that paper no uh, but i but i i know the i know the author yeah, i mean that was the basic idea that i mean yeah. basically uh, it looks at the critical exponents of the gap closing but the gap mm. doesn't close like uh, very fast the gap closes very slowly sure. i mean and, and that that the time scale of the gap closing if you take that time scale into account then i mean if you do do a fair resource count essentially then the, i mean the n square scaling is still there but this super heisenberg and all these claims i mean they basically fall by the wayside yes i completely exactly. agree. yeah okay so please carry on yeah, I mean, the, 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 thanks for pointing it out because this is a really important point. I mean, uh, there are like these claims of super Heisenberg scaling every single day, but uh, I mean, I mean that the, the resource count has to be fair. I completely agree there. And and also one more thing about Heisenberg scaling in the phase estimation picture versus the Heisenberg scaling in this picture. In the phase estimation picture, I mean, what we do is that we calculate the average photon number and we calculate the Heisenberg scaling with respect to the average photon number, right? So here we are calculating just, I mean, no matter what scaling we are talking about, we are calculating with respect to the number of particles in this many particle system, okay? Okay, let's move forward then. So yeah, I mean, that's why I wrote this n square scaling, not n power like nu by d scaling. I, okay, so, but now, I mean, the point is that this is second order phase transitions. And with second order phase transitions, you see, uh, you you have an intuition of uh, what an order parameter should be, etc. But now, if you talk about a, a type of phase transition where the order parameter is not local, so for example, topological phase transitions, which is, I mean, the order parameter, I mean, there is an order parameter, uh, which is basically the topological index of the system, but this is not local. I mean, this topological index you can calculate over the entire band, not locally. So, but even then, 
because uh, in quantum mechanics basically the state incorporates every bit of information there is so the fidelity susceptibility this would capture it so therefore i mean the qfi is fidelity susceptibility therefore qfi captures all kinds of phase transitions not just uh, the second order phase transitions not i mean it can capture uh, bkt as well it can capture capture topological as well because ultimately I mean, something changes at a phase transition and the state should i mean state description should capture everything okay so now uh, we have i mean now let's talk about the literature a bit so uh, normally what people do is that people see, see like different spin models like transversizing xy i mean whatever spin model is easy to do or is to simulate and they and calculate qfi with respect to every spin model with respect to some external parameter okay now I want to ask a question uh, that can we do something that is more general than that? I mean, you can take like one Hamiltonian, lift one Hamiltonian from one paper and calculate the QFI with respect to that ground state. Uh, can we do something slightly more general? Of course, I mean, I'm not claiming that I can do every Hamiltonian all at once, but uh, say that we have like something like, like a Gaussian state, like for uh, bosons. So for fermions, you have a quadratic state, which is a free fermion. Okay. So for, uh, by the way, I mean, do not be confused by these stars. These are daggers. I mean, I could not put the dagger in PPT. That's why I put stars. Okay. So let's look at this Hamiltonian, which looks very quadratic. So if you expand it out, this will be like C1 dagger, some number times C1 plus C2 dagger, some number times C2, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a quadratic Hamiltonian. Okay. And now this H tilde, H tilde is a matrix which only consists of numbers. All the operator, like operator part of the Hamiltonian that has gone into the fermionic operators like here, C1, C2, etc. Okay. And this H tilde, now you this A, B, so these are like, so if the system is like an n-particle system, this A and B, these are all n cross n matrices. Matrices where each entry is just numbers. Uh, I mean, uh, corresponding to uh, individual couplings. So, I mean, there are lots of examples of this. One example would be to do a Jordan Wigner transformation with respect to some particular A and B, and you end up with uh, the transversizing on the transverse XY model. Okay. So now, if if you have H tilde in this form, then eigenvalues come in opposite signed pairs. Like one, if there is an eigenvalue lambda, you have an eigenvalue which is corresponding to minus lambda. Okay. And you can calculate the eigenvectors of these things as like uv. If uh, lambda has eigenvectors uv, then minus lambda has eigenvectors uh, v star u star. Okay. So now, once we have described it, now if we want to calculate the quantum efficient information of this thing, of the ground state of this Hamiltonian, how do we do the ground state? We calculate the, the energy spectrum of this H tilde. And the minimum energy, the uh, eigenvalue of H tilde should be our ground state, right? So now for the ground state, we calculate the QFI explicitly in this formalism. And we got some form, uh, which I mean, uh, this is something that I really require some input about. So I got this form, which looks to be, I mean, uh, you can see, I mean, it looks to be a very interference type of term that you have one term which fully depends on U, one term which fully depends on V, and one term which looks like a cross term. Okay, so, so sorry. So what, what what physical system you would describe with this Hamiltonian? Okay, one. I mean, these are like any free, quadratic free fermion systems. So like if you have a Hamiltonian which is quadratic in C. So if you look at the Hamiltonian here, I mean, this H tilde you can take any numbers you like. So this is like say C one dagger C one, C two dagger yeah, C two. Basically, like what you, what what physical system I would describe with this. Okay, one example could be just the XY, right? So you, I mean, you do a Jordan Wigner, go back from the C1, C2 to spin models and choose, if you choose A and B like uh, judiciously, this is basically just an uh, Ising model. Okay. But, but I want to stress that, I mean, this is not, I mean, Ising model is one particular example of it when A and B are chosen in that way. But if you choose A and B in different ways, you can end up with different spin models. Okay. Okay. So let's move forward. 
So this expression of QFI that I got, I mean, uh, it looks to be, I mean, it is U and V, uh, there is some kind of interference effect between E and V in the calculation of QFI. So I initially expected that, okay, great. Here is an interference term. It looks very quantum -y. So it may be that the quantum advantage, whatever we talk about, it comes from this final interference term between U and V. And the first two terms are just very classical. Uh, and that hope was dashed. <laughs> I calculated the QFI with respect to this, with respect to Ising or whatever. And it turns out that that isn't the case. So like, it's not like this final term is giving us all the quantum advantage, but uh, I haven't calculated beyond it. So if you uh, find it interesting, I mean, we can talk or you can uh, work it out by yourself. Okay. So now th this is one approach. Another approach is that, okay, so, so we have fermionic Gaussian states like this. So these are all Gaussian because these are quadratic Hamiltonians. There is no uh, term like, for example, C dagger, C, C dagger 1, C dagger 2, uh, C1, C2. There is no term like that. Okay. So <clears throat> these are all quadratic terms. And then now if you map this C, C dagger, these are direct fermions. So if you map them to Majoranas, so basically the mapping is so you have C plus C dagger as your one operator and it's antiparticle as C minus C dagger times I. Then once you map them, then these things are essentially, I mean, they look like X and P in the sense that they are Hermitian operators. And then instead of X and P, the commutator relation that you have in normal bosonic systems, you have an anti-commutator relation between them. Okay, then you can construct the fermionic phase space. You can do a proceed in the exactly sense the same way as bosonic Gaussian states. You can calculate the SLDs. You can assume Gaussian statistics. You can <clears throat> basically use Wick's theorem to expand out everything in terms of uh, covariance matrices. And then you can get, I mean, uh, there was a paper in 2018 where they calculated SLDs for these uh, fermionic Gaussian states. Uh, and once you know the SLDs, I mean, the symmetric log derivatives, I mean, QFI is easy to get. I mean, it's basically the expectation value of squared of these SLDs. So expectation values you can calculate easily for Gaussian states because, I mean, everything is dependent on the covariance matrices. The higher moments are just functions of that. And uh, you can calculate the QFI as well. So, I mean, there is a work ongoing on this. I mean, the exact formula is easy to calculate, but like to calculate the implications on stuff. But I'll be very happy to talk about it if you like. Okay. But then in both of these methods, basically we are dealing with any kind of harmonic Gaussian systems. We are not specifically talking about Ising model. We are not specifically talking about a single spin model. Okay. I mean, the upshot is that there can be spin models. I mean, there are as many, many spin models are that you cannot have like a free fermion kind of description. You have to bring in some interacting fermions. So for these ones, uh, this uh, harmonic Gaussian kind of formalism, they do not work. You can try perturbatively. Uh, I mean, that should be like one very logical way of proceeding. But in general, I mean, for interacting spin systems, they do not work. Okay, that's like the caveat. So now talk about <clears throat> something which is uh, topological. So, uh, I mean, the typical example is the SSH chain. Uh, the idea of the SSH chain first came around when you people wanted to model uh, uh, it, some polymer of acetylene. So acetylene is, uh, you have two carbons and then you have a triple bond between carbons and then the final hand that the carbon has is hydrogen. Okay. So, I mean, if you talk about like organic chemistry, methane, for example, so carbon has four bonds. I mean, each carbon can form four bonds. So in methane, I mean, you have uh, four bonds, four, four of the bonds all are taken out by, it, uh, by it, uh, hydrogen atoms. If you have like a carbon carbon coupling double bonds, then you have uh, called ethylene. I mean, you have uh, double bonds between carbons, and then each of the carbons has two, uh, two bonds free essentially, and those two can host like hydrogens. So, and for acetylene, you have like triple bond between uh, two carbon atoms, and then the other one, the other bond is free essentially. So, it can attach it to another acetylene molecule. Uh, which can attach to another. So in that way, we get a polyacetylene chain. Okay. So now some, uh, I mean, Shushrifer and Higat, they wanted to model this polyacetylene chain. And essentially, I mean, the simplest idea is what they did. They uh, basically modeled it by a tight binding model, where you have different hop uh, hopping probabilities. The hopping probability between the triple bonds is much uh, smaller because the triple bond is much stronger. 
the hopping probability between the single bonds is much higher because the, the single bond is much weaker, obviously, by definition. So, but then, I mean, this one has like a supercell kind of structure, the alternative single bonds and triple bonds. So if you take two of them together, single bond and triple bond together, so this forms a big supercell. And then this supercell, you can see, I mean, this, uh, I mean, there are essentially n copies of them. And then if you want to calculate the, uh, the, the band picture of this one, so you will get that this, I mean, this, I mean, basically because there are in each individual supercell, there are two particular uh, uh, bonds. So you will see that the block Hamiltonian is like two by two, and then there is a direct sum. Therefore, there are only two energy bands. And now if these two energy bands touch, then at that point, you get a topological phase transition one, I mean, to one side, the 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 entire system, the ground state, it has a zero. To, uh, I mean, the to, uh, the char number is zero. At another side, the char number is one. Okay. So, but the char number is a property of an entire energy band, not the property of one particular localized portion of the system. If you are looking at one particular localized portion, you are not. You, I mean, the char number will be zero always. So, if you cut it out from everything else. Okay, so now in many body physics, there is the, I mean, there is a hypothesis that if the bulk is topological, then there must be some signature of the bulk at the edge. The, the, I mean, the edge should host some localized excitations. So if the bulk is topological, then if you put some excitation right at the edge of this chain, the excitation basically stays there. Okay. But if the bulk is trivial, uh, the char number is zero, then the excitation kind of slowly disperses into the bulk. Okay. So this edge localized states, we calculated the QFI of these edge localized states. And it's interesting that, I mean, the edge localized states exactly at the critical point, uh, the QFI is order of L square. <clears throat> L is the system, system size. And away from the critical point, this is order of one. This is a single particle system. But what is also interesting is that generally quantum fission information, I mean, we cal can calculate the QFI, but to measure the actual direction in which the Q, I mean, we should measure to get the QFI to saturate the Kramer Rao, that in general is kind of difficult. But here, fortunately, we, if we just do a site local measurement, that turns out to be optimal even mathematically. And now instead of edge states, which are like single particle states, you are putting in like single excitations at right at the edge. Instead of that, you are looking at like, like many body ground states, like for example, half filling. So here, I mean, there are uh, two bands. So if you have two bands, then half filling means that you are only filling the first band and the, I mean, the first band is entirely filled and lower band and the upper band is entirely unfilled. So in this case, we saw that for these many body ground states, QFI scales as L square, I mean, the N square, the system size at criticality, and at, at the topological phase transition point and away from the phase transition point, it's basically scales as n. With uh, we now could you, could you repeat? Could you could you repeat what is the parameter we estimate here? What is the physical meaning of parameter? Yeah. So uh, if we talk about the polyacetylene example here, so there are two bonds, right? Single bonds and triple bonds. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yes. I mean, let's let's assume that the strength of the bonds are like what J one and J two. Okay. Now, if you know one of these bonds, say you know that J1 is something, okay, then you want to estimate J2. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, I mean, yeah, the, so you, you estimate the strength of the bonds, I think. Yes, yes. So there mm -hmm. are two strengths. One strength is known, and from using that, I want to estimate the other unknown strength. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm talking about many body sensors being good. Uh, very very good i mean so far i mean this is all textbook stuff uh, and many body sensors i mean we talk about these things being good because i mean they are robust they are not susceptible to particle loss but then it, i mean the obvious question that uh, everybody asks okay i mean if they are so good i mean why aren't they here so uh, and i mean related i mean there was a conference like at uh, five or six months back in china and the one guy came in, I mean, he was like a very famous guy on magnetometry, not quantum magnetometry, but like, I mean, many body magnetometry, but quantum magnetometry in general. So like where these atoms all align along the same direction and you read off the signal. So, and uh, I gave the same talk that we have n square scaling, etc. And they, after the talk, I mean, obviously they are polite. So he asked me, okay, fine, n square scaling, how much n can we do? 
I was like, okay, uh, in experiments, maybe with iron traps, uh, 25, 30, if I'm being super lucky. And he says that I can do 10 power 6. So uh, I, I don't care what you do with 25, 30, 25 squared is what still 600 something. So uh, forget it. So, but that kind of hints as a real, real problem that the best possible kind of uh, this Ising model examples that you are talking about, we are saying that this n square scaling is good, but then how to get actual n square? If n is uh, five, then okay, n square is only 25. You can only do as much with that. So the next point is scalability. And now when we talk about Ising model in ion traps, in uh, superconducting qubit systems, this is exactly the same problem that uh, building quantum computers also faces. So uh, for example, with an ion trap, if you have like a linear ion trap, power trap, for example, so you want, you are shining lasers on it. So you cannot have this linear trap go like five kilometers with uh, 5 billion atoms trapped in it. So it will do decoy long before that. So now the idea is that, okay, instead of one big spin chain, how about we construct small spin chains and then we connect them together. Okay. So th this is basically the core idea that we, instead of like having an Ising chain of like size 500, we take like hundred different Ising chains, we connect them up together. And each of these chains are like size five, which are like manageable sized. And then can we use them as sensors instead, instead of like a one huge chain, which has like a big probability of decohering, et cetera. Okay. So, and when this idea came into my mind, then I uh, tried to re look at the literature. I mean, when, uh, what Conestment of Physicists actually did, and it was amazing. I mean, uh, there were, uh, so the two groups almost parallel, I, I, I do not know the prehistory behind this, but they almost came to the same conclusion around what 25 years back so one was uh, professor oleg derchko who is now in ukraine so he uh, calculated this uh, uh, you you have periodic defects in an ising chain that's what he termed it as i mean essentially that's what it is uh, with alternating with ising chains and these formalisms and then there was another work in china so they calculated the same thing and both of them came to the same conclusion that if you construct this modularly, then instead of one phase transition, I'm sorry, uh, instead of one phase transition, you get uh, multiple phase transitions, uh, which are nestled within the original phase transition itself. Like, I mean, if you take a look at this uh, bottom picture, you have, uh, I mean, if, if you had like a whole huge chain, then you will ha have only the blue region and the white region. So within the blue region where the magnetic field is uh, uh, not very large compared to the external couplings, you will have the ferromagnetic regime where the internal couplings dominate. And then when the external magnetic field dominates, there you'll have the white paramagnetic regimes. But then if you have a modular kind of construction, there you have kind of islands of paramagnetic regimes emerging within the ferromagnetic sea. So you now have more phase transitions to play with. So if you go from left to right, right around uh, gamma equal to 0 .0, 0 0.1 or something. So you can, instead of encountering, normally you would encounter one phase transition, which is para to ferro, which is around h equals minus one, and then one at h equal to one, which is again para to ferro to para. Instead of only encountering two phase transitions in the phase diagram, you will encounter multiple. How many you will encounter? That depends on the periodicity of, I mean, the, the size of the each individual module. Okay. So now the question is, I mean, this is a very cool phenomenon, obviously, but is this useful for, somehow for quantum sensing? Because we already saw that phase boundaries are good. So are these new phase boundaries good? So this is the question that we want to answer. And if you calculate the QFI, if you go from left to right, you see indeed that there are these islands which are captured by the QFI and the phase transition QFI is like super high, uh, close to these islands. Okay. And now if you want to calculate the, uh, uh, the uh, finite size scaling exponents, uh, the QFI scaling, etc., the finite size scaling exponents, I mean, they are basically the same with I mean, identical with the original phase transitions. Therefore, it has all these critical exponents same as the original ones. So the nature of phase transitions is not super different. It's the same phase transition. And the scaling is again at each uh, each of these uh, crossing of the phase boundary, the phase transition is again n square. Okay. So 
I mean, the n square can be like even the prefactor behind n square can be different, but it's all n square in that sense. Now, I mean, something interesting happens uh, when the period is like uh, r tends to infinity. So this means that you are basically having uh, very, very big chains coupled together. R is basically the size of these modules. Then around gamma equal to zero. So gamma, gamma exactly equals zero is basically the Fermi C. So this is just an XX model. The ground state is infinitely generated. But around gamma equal to zero. So if gamma is very small from zero, then this degeneracy is broken. So you get a clear ground state. So around gamma equal to zero, these phase boundaries. So these islands that they emerge, they, the islands almost become continuous. Like there are so many of these islands. In that if you go towards gamma equal to gamma tends to zero. So at the around there, if you go from left to right, you will encounter basically within every epsilon interval, you will in, encounter one critical region. So no matter where you are, you are never very far from the from a phase transition point. And consequently, I mean, I, I, we showed that the phase transition points are associated with Heisenberg scaling. We are never very far away from Heisenberg scaling. But then obviously this is very unrealistic because uh, this assumes that uh, you can build like this huge individual modules, which is the thing that we tried to avoid in the first place. But as a limiting case, nonetheless, I mean, it's good to know. Okay, so now we talked about the QFI. Now, I mean, the legitimate question that one can obviously ask uh, and should be asked essentially is that, okay, I mean, this is QFI good, but how do I actually saturate it? Because in general, at least for these systems, even for Ising, the optimal measurement that op kind of saturates the QFI, this is a, in general a horrible measurement. I mean, it's not like a, a correlation function or a two-point operator or a single-point operator, nothing. In general, it's like highly entangled and well, uh, it's it's hard to find essentially without any dedicated kind of procedure. So, but now for our, for our perspective, it's. Uh, to find it's enough to find a good enough basis which is actually easy to measure okay so for nq bits if you want to measure in the configuration basis i mean the number of basis elements grows as exponential right so to power n so these are huge number of outcomes and then some outcomes can i mean we get basically uh, noise can play a huge role in these outcomes and stuff so then instead of that we assume the total magnetization basis so if all of them, I mean, if the zero zeros are essentially in the Z basis, so if all of them are like all zero, 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 so then total spin is minus N. So if the total spin has to be minus N plus one, then one of these has to flip. Now, which one will flip? There are N possibilities, right? The first one can flip, the second one can flip and so on and so forth. If minus N plus two, then two of them has to flip. So the uh, number of possibilities N is NC2. So, so on and so forth. So you have this total magnetization basis. So the choice is like there are instead of two to, two to the power n choices, the choice is only two n plus one. Like it can go from minus n, the total spin to plus n. Okay. So this should be a much more easier measurement to do. But with only this measurement, we see that the QFI is basically saturating. I mean, it's it, it's almost too close to the QFI. I mean, it's it's slightly different. I mean, if you look very fine into the plot, I mean, it's slightly different, but it captures essentially all the features. I mean, for example, for the modular one, uh, if you look at the blue one, the blue solid line is the CFI, which is the achievable bound with respect to this basis. And it essentially has the same behavior as the uh, dotted one, which is the QFI. Okay, so uh, even though that this is not optimal in the SLD picture or not optimal in theoretically, practically this is good enough for us to go. Okay. So any questions so far? Zero, I think you can continue. Should I continue? Okay, perfect. Yeah. So now we talked about uh, uh, like, second order phase transitions let's talk about uh, topological like ssh uh, the modular version of ssh okay so here again we see that uh, we can construct like different supercells so for example in this case i mean if you assume that these reds are these blacks are like single bonds in the, in the polyacetyl example that i gave and the reds are triple bonds and the blues are also triple bonds so reds and blues are like equal Okay, then basically it's just the same example as the SSH, right? But now, if you have these reds and blues different, then the supercell size is effectively four, okay? So because the supercell size is four, 
I mean, the block Hamiltonian is four cos four. Therefore, you have four different energy bands. So two of them are like uh, po positive energy bands. Two of them are like negative energy bands. So when you talk about the many body ground state, we are not talking about only the lowest energy band being occupied. We are talking about at half filling. We are talking about all the lower lower two energy bands being occupied. And therefore, if you have lower two energy bands occupied, the QFI is basically the sum of these QFIs. See a sum of QFI of each individual bands. And then when you sum them up together, you see that essentially it uh, again reproduces the same phase transition behavior, the topological phase transition behavior uh, that is predicted by the char number. So here, I mean, you have the char number uh, transition between like uh, say 0 to 1, 0 to 2, 0 to 3, 2 to 3, and these transitions. And then each of these transitions, each of these topological phase boundaries, they are associated with the QFI, the bottom left one with the QFI being um, super large. And essentially, we saw, the, I mean, if you sample any single point for closer to the phase boundaries, you will again see this n squared scaling at the many body ground state. OK, so this is for local sensing. And now, uh, one thing that I have uh, deliberately ignored so far is that, OK, for local sensing, I have said that we have to optimize the basis. But now, optimizing the basis, this basis optimization, you can only do if you know the parameter value. But the whole point behind sensing is that you do not know the parameter value. Otherwise, how, why would you do the sensing stuff, right? So then uh, <clears throat> you can slightly generalize it, that if you do not know, but you know this within a certain range, then uh, if you only know the range, then from that, you can calculate the global average variance per round, which is basically the average of the, the variance of theta. But this average is taken over the Fisher information QFI with respect to every parameter value that's within that range. So this was done in like two or three different papers. But then there is a catch that this was done primarily in the context of thermometry. So there, no matter what the range is in thermometry, I mean, the energy me measurement is optimal. I mean, you know that everything is diagonal in the energy measurement. So that's the measurement that is going to give you the maximum advantage, I mean, the maximum information. But then if you go beyond the energy measurements, the optimal uh, FQ, FQ should not be optimal everywhere, right? Because I mean, this bound is in general not tight. Because the same FQ, that you calculate for like any point between uh, like this lambda max and lambda mean, they, uh, it may not be possible to saturate that bound. Because at that point, the quantum Fisher information at each point, the measurement basis changes. Therefore, I mean, we will do, use this bound at least in the context of this paper anyway, but a more achievable bound is that instead of uh, yeah, like averaging over the one by Fisher informations, one by quantum Fisher informations, we average over by the inverse of classical Fisher informations with respect to some measurement basis, which is not fixed beforehand. But then this is fixed with respect to the parameters that we know in the system, that what is the, the range, the window of the parameters that is given to us. Okay. So if you can see that in this achievable bound definition, I mean, this is something that we are working on right now. I mean, this uh, it has some uh, funny properties, but uh, this achievable bound definition, this uh, essentially says that, okay, so if you have a specific measurement basis with respect to that measurement basis, you can have like a, a global precision, a global average precision that you can try to minimize, okay? Okay, but why why don't you use just Bayesian cost here instead? You could use uh, like quadratic Bayesian cost, for example, for this lambda. Yes, I can. I can. Yes, I can. And then I you can, could also explicitly compute the cost because the measurement is then easy to find. Yes, I completely agree. I completely agree with that. I mean, you can you can definitely do it. I mean, that's how it, in many papers, I mean, this global sensing has been handled. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. That that is one one more way of doing it. Yeah. Okay, so for global sensing, I mean, we saw here that these uh, these islands, so these phase boundaries are like I mean, they are associated with more fission quantum fission information. So when you average over them, so it stands to reason that multiple phase boundaries, when you average over them, they will give you a better result than a single phase boundary. Because from the phase boundary, the QFI is bad. So therefore, the average precision would be bad. 
that will suffer. The average variance would go up. So now we do it for uh, XY models. And basically, to have a fair comparison, we have this external magnetic field. We can uh, we allow it to uh, like uh, we, we allow it to have a control magnetic field which is known. So the total magnetic field that the system experiences is the control magnetic field, which is known, plus the unknown magnetic field. So the control magnetic field can be optimized here and there to ensure that we stay close to the critical point of each of these sensors of the uniform as well as the modular one. Okay, and we see that the uniform sensor, I mean, if you look at the bottom left of the plot, uh, the uniform sensor performs, I mean, the modular sensor performs much better than the uniform sensor, at least for small, relatively small delta H widths. For large delta H widths, I mean, again, I mean, then you get uh, sucked into these uh, paramagnetic islands. And if you get within these islands, you can see these plots here also. So if you get sucked within these paramagnetic islands, the QFI is again, super low. So therefore, or the, or the variance is super high. Therefore, if you get this to be large enough, then you are essentially guaranteed to fall inside one of them. And therefore, your you know, precision will suffer. But so long as you are not doing it, I mean, essentially, the modular one can give you much, much better set, uh, the global average variance than the uniform one. So if you take a look look at examples here, so this, by the way, I mean, this is log scale. So I mean, this is not like uh, slightly better. This is much be better in that sense. So if you look at here, I mean, just to, to put a comparison. So if delta H is like what, 0 0.05, something like that, and then the precision that is afforded by the, this is the best possible one because you have the control fields. The precision afforded by it, n equal to 80 of the modular is basically the same as the four times uniform of, of the uniform chain. So you can do more with less essentially. And also for, I mean, the obvious question that can ask is, one can ask is, okay, I mean, this is all good in QFI theory, but you said that this bound is not tight. So what about some bound which is tight? I mean, where the measurement is, uh, or explicitly uh, like uh, demonstrated beforehand. So, uh, I mean, we do this uh, spin measurement, total spin measurement again, and we, this is a specific measurement. And we compare this specific measurement result with uh, the not in general tight QFI bound that we found here. Okay. And we see that this uh, blue solid line is still firmly less than the <clears throat> black dotted line, which is the in general, not very tight bound. Okay, so even with uh, a chosen measurement, which we know to be not optimal, but at least relatively easy to do, we can still have better global variance uh, compared to some, uh, I mean, the optimal uh, precision that you can get with the uniform sensors, at least for a large range of delta H. And we see similar phenomenon in SSH chains where this black dotted line is the original SSH one. And if you have these modular ones where you have uh, you are tuning one by one, then you can see that everything is, I mean, the, the variance is much lower. Therefore, I mean, it's much better to use these modular sensors. Okay. So this is the broad uh, like outline of the thing, but the, I mean, so far the modular sensors that we have discussed, uh, I mean, the, I mean, each module is identical and each module, the coupling between modules, they are also identical. So both of these conditions can be relaxed. Each modules can be different and the couplings can also be different. So this is one, I mean, uh, kind of very, very obvious way of generalization. Uh, I mean, you cannot choose these couplings randomly because this will be understand localized, but you, if you choose these couplings by some good algorithm, maybe, I mean, we can get even more advantage. That's one. Another thing is that uh, you, you want to choose something. I mean, if you want to do some uh, super fine measurement or stuff, you first start out with some, some number of small modules. You start out with two modules, you see the results, you then you want to optimize, I mean, increase the precision by adding one more module at a time. So this can adaptive op, kind of a, a addition of modules, they can also follow. Also, one more idea is that you can designate some modules for measurements where within that module, you can do whatever measurement you like, but you cannot do measurements outside that particular module. So this is like a remote sensing kind of stuff where, I mean, the effects of the sensor probe in the other modules, I mean, they flow towards the measurement module. This is one. Also, the couplings between each modules, I mean, they are assumed to be identical here. We can optimize over these couplings. And you can play around with other parameters as well. So this is the general idea. Okay, thank you. 
so yeah thank you chiru thank you now we open for discussion okay if you have question please feel free to ask so so maybe i will ask one more question so because i guess you if, if i remember correctly this figure of merit you are using was just based on fisher at different points so yes. so i understand uh, it does not under it, it would not correctly capture the problem that for example at different points of parameters your state is the same so in principle you cannot distinguish it but locally it changes but it goes back to the same state for example yes if you go through this different transitions maybe the state goes back to the same state no uh, and then in, yeah, and in principle yes, you yeah. cannot estimate properly if, if you did for example bayesian approach you would see this that that your estimation is bad Yes, I, I agree. I agree. So because this is just an average. So basically that things within the average can be different, but the average can be same. I completely agree with that. Yeah. So, so I, okay. So my understanding is, it, it, is that to capture properly this global estimation, you need to use Bayesian because other way, other, otherwise it's, I would say not really very, okay. It's, it's just a bound, which uh, it may not be very informative. It's okay. No, I mean, I would just put one one thing here. So uh, if you have QFI, then it's just a bound. I completely agree. But then if you fix the measurement basis, then with respect to that measurement basis, if you get something good, then I mean, if you get something bad, okay, fair enough. You might, uh, might have chosen the measurement basis badly. But if you get something good, then maybe, I mean, it's not uh, that bad a deal. Because if, no, but, what, but, but it's still, you know, it's still maybe like that. Locally, you have good sensitivity at different points, but your state goes back to the same state after some time, after some parameter change. Yes, and mm -hmm. and you are not able, for example, to distinguish parameter h and h plus some delta h because basically your state is the same there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean the fissure may be high on on the whole region. It's you know yeah. it's like with GHZ state it's like with GHZ state and phase estimation. Fisher is high, even for for a fixed measurement, it's high for every phi, but what mm -hmm. but you cannot distinguish states that differ by two pi over n. Yeah. So yeah, in this yeah. sense, from Bayesian point of view, it's a very bad state. Yeah, that 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 I would agree with. Yes, that I would agree with. I mean, this doesn't capture it. Yeah, I can agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. If anyone has more question, please, uh, I unmute your mic and you can ask. Okay, I will ask one question. It is very silly, I know. So you talk about uh, like IID scenario. Yeah. So are there any literature where they tackle about non IID scenarios? Uh, I, for quantum sensing for quantum sensing i mean one thing that i i mean there, there are examples of sequential measurements for example so here in uh, uh, i mean in the kind of uh, experiment the, the results that i talked about hello am i audible yeah you are audible yeah i mean sorry it's just something, the VPN thing. something okay. is happening with your sharing screen because it is going to infinity but yeah i don't know i, I, I am seeing it <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like this old yeah. Windows PCs. Okay, so uh, with IID, so there there is this ensemble kind of description, but you can go, go beyond that as well. So basically, you start off with some uh, rounds. We take the first round measurement results, and then based up based upon first round measurement results, you can get it, I mean measure the second round in a different way, and then you based upon the second round measurement results, you can get the third round measurement results in a different way. We are not uh, reaching the asymptotic limit. Okay. Mm. And another uh, like query, like you were mm -hmm. talking about lot, uh, like this. Uh, do you remember where you were talking about this modular, uh, modular way of quantum sensing? So you have this phase yeah. transition where you have these points. So does it somehow yeah. relate to number of points, relate to number of modules you have? 
Yes, 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 yes. So uh, for for the XY models, for example, so the number of uh, number of new islands that you see emerging, so the number of new islands is basically identical to the num number of modules essentially. No, 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 not the number of modules. So the number of particles within the module. Okay. Oh, so, perfect. I mean, if there are like one big module here, so we will see the usual phase transition. If you have two uh, two modules. I mean, if you have basically dimers, you will have like twice the number of uh, islands. If you have like trimers, in that sense, I mean, you will have, I mean, the super cell size is three, you will get like three times the uh, the phase boundaries. That's all. Yeah. Okay. If we don't have any more questions, uh, we'll close this session. And if you have any other queries, which you want to ask, uh, you can contact Chiru. Thank you, Chiru, again, Thank for this nice talk. You.